Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us. My name is Dr. Sivan Biyukin, pronouns are she and L, and I'm the inaugural director of Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and Accessibility of the Office of Equity, Diversity, Inclusion at the University of Calgary. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to EDI Week 2023. This is my first week, uh, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Week at the University of Calgary, and I'm excited to be leading it this year in my new role. EDI Week is about celebrating EDI initiatives on campus and reaffirming our commitment to inclusive excellence. EDI Week 2023 presents a series of keynote speakers uh, who continually inspire and challenge what it means to support equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility institutionally, individually, and in community. This year, the theme is solidarity through intersectional lenses. These workshops, speaker events, and presentations are possible due to the collaborative work on campus around EDI initiatives. Solidarity is about in intentional, authentic, respectful, and critical thinking and action. Action is what Dr. Wanda Costin's keynote focused on yesterday. The concept of critical allyship really resonated with this definition and what solidarity means, moving us away from performative allyship and hashtag activism, as she referenced it. The terms that stood out to me also were collaborator, co-conspirator, accomplice, and how we make change and fight for equity. Today, we have a keynote panel discussing the topic of solidarity through an intersectional lens equity in action. The panel includes Dr. Kim Clark, Professor of Anthropology and Assistant Dean, Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and Decolonization in the Faculty of Social Science at Western University, and Dr. Aruna Srivastava, Associate Dean, Pluralism and Inclusion with UCalgary's Faculty of Arts, and Dr. Dr. An uh, Sonia Aujlabular, Co-Chair of the City of Calgary Anti-Racism Action Committee. So before we begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are on Zoom and we are in, on a Zoom meeting, but I am located in the city of Calgary. So I, I, you know, we might be located in different areas, different regions, different territories. So I ask you all to please reflect on the territories upon which you are located at this moment. So I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, the Pikuni, and the Gaina First Nations, as well as the Tsutina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Jiniki, Bearspa, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. I recognize my own location, and I recognize my recent movement from Amiskwachi, Waskaigan, Edmonton, to uh, Mokansis, uh, Calgary. I want to begin by saying that uh, I'm appreciative of uh, Elder uh, Colleen Sitting Eagle's uh, blessing yesterday to open the ceremony for us for EDI week, uh, for all the events that are coming forward, and Dr. Penny Worthner's opening as well. So EDI week is about celebrating, is celebrating six years of encouraging respectful, transparent conversations through presentations and workshops geared towards uplifting and emboldening our campus community to generate social change. This week is a chance for UCalgary to honor our diverse community by spotlighting important themes on the lived experiences of members of equity deserving groups in higher education through an intersectional lens. EDI Week marks the beginning of Black History Month with the theme, Hours to Tell for this year. Please visit our website for more information on events, presentations, and resources. At UCalgary, we are proud to be recently recognized for the ETI, EDI Data Hub. It showcases the collaborative work on campus to present EDI data at the institutional, international, national levels on demographics in post-secondary context. This helps us track progress in implementing equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility throughout UCalgary's campus. Please make sure to visit our website for more information. Today, we have the pleasure to discuss solidarity in action and how to think through intersectional lenses with three incredibly accomplished panelists. 
It is now my distinct pleasure to include, uh, to introduce them. Uh, and, you know, each one will present separately. So I'll uh, give a brief introduction of each panelist as they begin to speak. They will be speaking 20 minutes each in length, and we will then move to questions. So we will begin with Dr. Clark's presentation. Dr. Kim Clark is a professor of anthropology and assistant dean, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and decolonization in the Faculty of Social Science at Western University. She has previously served as a department chair, a graduate program director, and president of the faculty union. Her most recent book uh, is entitled Conjuring the State, Public Health Encounters in Highland, Ecuador, 1908-1945. And this will be published later this year by the University of Pittsburgh Press. I'm really looking forward to, to seeing it in, in publication and in print and, and reading it as well. So today she will share her recent research led with students on accessibility and experiences with barriers on campus and what solutions are necessary to think about. Please welcome Dr. Kim Clark. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this panel. I'm very happy to be here today and share some of our research results. Um, I also want to say that I am joining you from the traditional territories of the Quechua Nation. Um, I'm on the equator at about 2,800 meters above sea level in Quito, Ecuador. Um, all right, let's see if I can this. So uh, my purpose today is to um, listen to student voices from our research, research on the access experience of disabled students at Western. I find these student voices very powerful. Um, and I learned a lot from them, although I already had an interest in accessibility. So I'm happy to share some of what they had to say. So I wanna use um, this information to consider some relatively easy ways to deepen accessibility. Uh, not things that require a complete redesign, but easy ways um, that students have told us uh, can enhance accessibility in the classroom. Um, and at the same time, think uh, a little bit about what other kinds of students also benefit when we adopt these practices um, and be mindful of faculty workload. I don't think there's any way to deepen accessibility without uh, really having front of mind um, the role of instructors and the pressures on instructors. So I do think we're all the sort of product of all of the experiences we've had. Um, so I am a, an anthropologist um, in Ecuador uh, doing research right now. Um, and um, I'm an instructor, right? Who's trying to uh, um, improve my own teaching practices, learning from my own mistakes and also from students. Um, I am an assistant dean uh, participating in and observing conversations about EGI where I noticed that disability and accessibility really quickly seemed to be sort of the first to fall away from the discussion. Um, and that motivated me to, to, to um, try to probe a bit more um, about these aspects of life on campus. I'm a recent department chair. And uh, what that means is that I'm, I'm very aware that there are all kinds of things that are not um, uh, up to individual instructors. There are uh, many decisions that are made at the departmental or university level. Um, I think it's important that I'm a former faculty union president, mostly because I, I am in sort of intensely aware of um, workload issues for instructors. And I do think it's relevant that I'm a parent of three kids navigating their education. Um, one has ADHD and two of them um, developed chronic health uh, conditions as teenagers. Um, so I've learned a lot from them about um, the impact of, of sort of small decisions um, instructors make in the classroom. Um, but they also make me aware that, you know, any of us can become um, disabled at, at any moment. And, you know, if we're lucky to live long enough, we probably all will. Um, so just a quick acknowledgement of my wonderful research team. Um, and especially I want to acknowledge the contributions of the three undergraduate research interns 
who are very familiar with disability experience and helped to shape our research and uh, carried out our interviews and really participated all the way along. So how many students, uh, university students have disabilities? We don't really know. Um, Stats Canada uh, found uh, in 2017 that 13% of the population aged 15 to 24 in Canada um, have disabilities. And uh, of course we have students of other ages as well, but this is just a kind of general figure. Um, but the Canadian University um, Survey Consortium in their 2021 survey of graduating students across Canada found that 27% of those students um, uh, identify as having a disability and there what really stood out were the mental health conditions. So just quickly to let you know the kind of research that we did last summer, um, we did a survey of students who identify um, as disabled uh, that gathered 83 responses. So more than I expected, um, but at the same time, clearly not everyone on campus uh, who has a disability. Um, and these, this survey included really extensive comments um, telling us about student experiences. And we did capture um, particip participants from all faculties on campus and all levels of study. Uh, and then we had some follow-up interviews that our student researchers did with 15 students who found at the end of the survey that they had more they wanted to tell us. So generally about our approach to the research, um, our goal was not to gather a representative sample, but just to learn more about some students' experiences. Um, I'm not even sure we know what a representative sample would look like. In fact, we don't know enough about disability on campus. Um, and we focused on, you know, it was not an assessment of accessibility services on campus or anything like that. We were focusing our questions on the impact of, you know, everyday practices, small decisions we make consciously or not when we go into the classroom or in, in also in terms of other services offered on campus. Um, small omissions we make, for instance, that, um, that can really impact accessibility. We also didn't assume we could predict answers in advance um, about the experiences of, of students with disabilities. Um, so we use very open-ended questions. Uh, students had to, you know, write in their comments, identifying, for instance, one um, teaching practice that made a course more accessible to them given their particular uh, disability. So we were happy to see that rather than just skipping over those uh, questions that required a bit more commitment on their part, they provided really rich answers to those questions. And finally, we approached students with disabilities as experts on what makes the university accessible or not for them given their particular situation. Um, so some of you may recognize this as influenced by Dorothy Smith's uh, method of inquiry of, um, of institutional ethnography. So we were not looking for um, a, a representative sample, but we, 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 we gained some insights just from the composition of, of, of the students who did participate in our research. So we found that one quarter of them have undiagnosed disabilities. And um, some of them explain that there's a long wait list to see a specialist for their condition, or uh, it's an out-of-pocket out of expense of $3,000 to get um, diagnosed. So there were reasons that they, they don't have a diagnosis. Um, we also found out that a third of them are not registered with the Accessible Education Office on campus. Um, we found that the vast majority of them have non-apparent, also sometimes called invisible disabilities. Um, and by vast majority, I mean two of our 83 participants said they have visible disabilities. Another 17 said they have both visible and non-apparent. And the remaining 64 have non-apparent disabilities. So there are more um, students with disabilities on campus and in our classrooms than what we know and then, than, what we, than what we see. Um, many of our participants also have multiple disabilities. Um, they, they talked about how uh, their disabilities affect different parts of their body um, at different moments, how their, um, their symptoms um, sort of ebb and flow, come and go. Um, and in terms of the broad categories of disabilities that they identified, um, just under 20% uh, mentioned physical or functional disabilities. So this would be mobility, um, dexterity, pain conditions can be functional disabilities. Um, and just over 10% mentioned sensory disabilities such as vision, hearing related and so on. 
Um, a little bit over a third mentioned um, having mental health related disabilities and just slightly more than that identified cognitive or learning related disabilities. So uh, by this, uh, we're talking about dyslexia, um, ADHD, autism spectrum and, and related kinds of disabilities. So um, students told us uh, things like this. My disabilities affect almost every aspect of my experience at Western, from classroom attendance, assignment completion, examinations, health and wellness, productivity, time management, and more. And another student said, I'm entering fourth year of university this fall and have only ever had one professor ask me if I'm okay or need any help. Um, another student said, many professors set hard deadlines or detect marks for missing class. My medical flare-ups make me too unwell to attend class or write exams at times. Even though this is documented in my accessible education plan, I have still had instructors become irritated and try to penalize me. I care deeply about school and feel very sad when I'm accused of slacking off when in reality, I also want nothing more than to feel well enough to attend class. So I find this very um, powerful, partly because every word of that could have been written by my own kid who has a chronic pain condition, um, but also because this comment and many others in our research made it clear that students with disabilities know um, painfully well uh, what is behind um, instructors' doubts about, uh, about their requests for accommodations. They know that um, instructors and sometimes their classmates too think that they're trying to get away with something and that they're faking it. So turning to some um, simple ways to enhance access according to our research participants. Um, and, um, you know, I, the way I think about it, knowing now what I know from these students, my question to myself is why wouldn't we do the following? Right? What would be our pedagogical reason for not doing some simple things that don't cost us very much? So one is um, quite straightforward, provide information like instructions in multiple formats, which is important even for those present in class if we think about it. Um, so here I'm talking about things like posting instructions for an assignment in our learning management system, um, and then you know, elaborating on those instructions in class. Why wouldn't we um, film a very short uh, video and post that as well so that all students present or not would have access to that. Um, so some of the things that, uh, reasons that this is helpful, one student said, sitting in a classroom, I cannot listen well because I cannot stim. So this is a student with autism. And it is sensory assault. So I miss half of everything anyways. Another student said, my ADHD leads to me looking distracted when I'm paying attention. In smaller classes, it can be harder to focus if I'm too busy trying to look like I'm paying attention. And another said, I try my best to make it to class, but sometimes it just isn't physically possible. So, you know, just to pause for a second and think about um, who else this it might benefit if we were to ensure that information is available to everyone. So there's all kinds of reasons people miss class, right? They may have um, family obligations. They may have a kid who has to um, flip to, to homeschooling uh, because we're in a pandemic. Um, uh, they may, you know, they may become ill. They may have symptoms of COVID. Um, and we'd actually maybe don't want them in our classroom um, under those conditions. Um, there's all kinds of reasons people miss, miss a class. Um, and then even for those present, being able to go back over instructions um, is, is very helpful. Um, I'm thinking about uh, people who have, uh, students who have people sitting around them who are distracting them. Um, I'm thinking about students whose first language is not the language of instruction. Um, so these are just some of the, the, the kinds of, of students who may not be disabled, but would benefit from some of these really quite simple ways to have enhanced access. And it's similar kinds of students throughout um, this discussion today who could benefit. Um, another practice that was highlighted a lot by students in our research is um, providing lecture slides to facilitate note taking. So this is something that I've been doing for quite a while. I post um, an outline of my PowerPoint um, and the same information in the Word document um, so that students can download them in advance of the class 
um, follow my lecture more more easily, know when I'm moving from one one uh, one topic to another. Um, but also, you know, change the font, uh, create spaces between um, the kind of headings, uh, and uh, and can more easily um, take their notes there. So uh, one student said, um, some of my professors don't provide slides, and that makes it a lot harder to follow along or find my place if I get distracted. Um, professors that do have slides are very helpful. They don't know about my diagnosis, but I think it makes a big difference to me. And another pointed out that they struggle with dexterity. So if an instructor is going to speed through the slides, please post them as a student can't keep up with their note taking. But on the other hand, if you refuse to post the slides, then please make sure you proceed at a pace that allows me to write my notes. We do want students to be able to follow our lectures, I think. Um, so again, students whose first language is our language is not the language of instruction. Um, you know, all kinds of students can benefit uh, from this practice. Another is to take advantage of accessible formatting for documents and websites. So we do have students who use screen readers, whether because of their learning um, disabilities or um, because they have vision uh, disabilities. Um, so we can use uh, built-in accessibility checkers and documents and use embedded headings um, in both documents and course websites uh, to help those students. Um, and I do find that using the headings reminds me to check to see if the outline that appears from the use of the headings is actually a logical flow of, of, of the information I'm providing. So one student shared that it was inaccessible um, if people did post slides, but posted them as PDFs. Um, so PowerPoints allow them to export the text directly, but PDFs do not. This is not something I knew. Um, and another student said uh, it was inaccessible if the PowerPoints are not posted online, but also if the contrast is not sharp enough for the student to read. So we may be using color, we may, may, may be using fonts and so on, contrast that's not sharp enough. With uh, the posting of uh, advanced posting, um, a student can download it and then manipulate it in ways that they can they can use it. Um, I didn't, uh, um, Saran has turned on a five minute warning. Okay, uh, I don't have any quotes here from students, um, but I, uh, I, I do wanna highlight the importance of using a microphone for in-person classes, um, whether for students with, uh, with hearing loss um, or for students, again, whose first language is not uh, English. You may also find uh, that students are using noise canceling headphones in class. That's actually to be able to listen to you and to block out the distractions. And they should be able to connect with the microphone. Um, so if you see a student with, with, with headphones, it may be precisely to listen to you. Please also always provide a break in classes longer than an hour, whether they're uh, in-person or remote synchronous. Um, you can imagine all kinds of reasons that someone may need to take a break, whether to bring their focus back, as this one student um, highlights, uh, to stretch their legs, to go to the bathroom. Uh, many students um, have health conditions that require frequent bathroom breaks, um, to, have a, to have a snack, to check their insulin. There's all kinds of reasons a student may need a break. Um, and some students really emphasize the importance of predictable timing of breaks. So helpful for them to know, okay, in this three hour class, at the midway point, there'll be a 15 minute break and that helps them pace themselves. So here I've changed the heading from simple ways to enhance access to ways to enhance access. Um, these may or may not work uh, depending on um, enrollment in a course, the nature of the assignments, um, all kinds of things uh, that differ between courses, but something to consider. So one is flexible um, deadlines. This was very, very highly rated um, in, in our research by students with disabilities. Now, not so flexible that it creates a problem with students with executive um, uh, dysfunction, um, like students with ADHD. Um, so some flexibility, I've had a success with something I call a late days bank, where all students in the class know that they can withdraw late days from, from a bank that I set up at the beginning of the course. They have six late days there with no documentation, no, um, no explanation, they can withdraw late days when they need them for the three writing assignments that I have. It's all on a single, uh, through a survey um, tool. 
And so it's all in a single spreadsheet. It's much easier for me as an instructor than um, dealing with a whole bunch of emails and, and requests for um, extensions and so on. Students also um, highlighted multiple ways to participate and demonstrate their learning. So one student uh, mentioned, um, for instance, allowing students to write a reflection, send an email, speak in class, speak privately. Um, others mentioned in uh, synchronous online learning, participate with or without the camera, with a microphone or in the chat. Some instructors have had um, success with a kind of choose your adventure assignment structure where there might be you know, five assignments through a term um, of different kinds, an exam, an essay, a podcast, and so on. Um, students have to do three um, and they can sort of choose which ones they do, choose their adventure. Um, and and uh, that some instructors find that that spreads the grading up as well um, over, the, over the term. I wanna mention hy hybrid delivery, which is more complicated, but maybe not as complicated as we think. So this is in-person classes with an option to access the information in another way, going back to the first point. So students um, you know, talk about having a bad day and not being able to come to class and how stressful it is to miss the entire lesson. Another student mentioned their complaint pain um, that you know, made it very difficult to come in. Um, other students mentioned attending class and then reinforcing their learning with a lecture recordings. Again, that could be students whose first language is not the language of instruction. Um, and also uh, students with ADHD um, listen to recordings at double speed. So their processing speed um, is probably faster than the speed at which we often um, lecture to make sure that everyone is following us, right? So they would be there in class, but then re-listen and double the speed so that they, they it can hold their attention. So this is actually my final slide. Um, I do want to mention asynchronous online delivery as something that was really highlighted by a lot of the students in our research. Not all of them. Some students with disabilities prefer in-person class. Um, but there was a wide range of reasons they mentioned that this was advantageous for them. Um, so asynchronous, um, they're able to do the class when they're able, when they're feeling up to it. Uh, rewinding and re-listening saved a student so much trouble, they said. Um, severe social anxiety distracts them when they're in in-person lectures. Um, closed captioning helps them uh, pause and take notes. Again, something that would help um, students whose first language is not the language of instruction, which of course is not only international students. We have Canadian students whose first language is not the language of instruction. Um, and uh, I wanna give the last word to a student who um, mentioned my grades improved so much during the pandemic primarily due to it being the first time I had real access to all of my course material and not just the classes I was able to make it to. Um, so that was actually not the final word. Um, I do wanna mention that as a former department chair, my ideal situation, if there were say required courses that had two sections offered to have one in person to accommodate those who prefer that kind of learning and one asynchronous online, that's a question of sort of departmental program level planning. Um, so I, I, uh, I'll just wrap up here. Thank you again for your attention. And, and, I, and say that I hope that this gives you some ideas um, of what would make our classrooms more accessible, help our students learn more, which I think is our, is our goal, um, and, and in ways that don't necessarily increase the burden on instructors who are already, I know, dealing with a lot. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Kim Clark. This was really, really wonderful. Um, the way you centered student voices and brought their experiences to light and the proposals around accommodations uh, in, in teaching and classroom and the ways that you know we continue to stigmatize needs and different needs or different ways of learning that translates not only in student experiences but later on as faculty experience and also as staff and the ways in which we generally think about that so i appreciated that uh, very much and i think we'll have a good discussion in in the next um, next minute so uh next presenter is dr aruna srivastava uh, dr aruna is uh, an associate dean of the faculty of arts in pluralism and inclusion and an associate professor in the Department of English at Duke Calgary. 
Dr. Sirvasava is affiliated with the International Indigenous Studies Program as well in the Faculty of Arts. She has engaged in nonprofit social justice community work in Vancouver, Calgary, as well as in post-secondary institutions in Alberta, British Columbia, and Ontario, focusing on anti-racism, EDIA, disability, decolonization, and organizational change, as well as on pedagogy and curriculum. More recently, she has focused on intersectionality in the context of disability, accessibility, aging, ageism in academia, and how concepts of solidarity and alliance have functioned before and during COVID. Today, she'll be discussing her extensive research over the years and contributions on campus in equity, diversity, inclusion, and ways of thinking collaboratively and through solidarity across the various equity-deserving groups. So please welcome Dr. Una Srivastava. Hi there, thank you. Thank you for that um, introduction, Sivan. And I also want to say that I, uh, a lot of the, the things that I'm going to be talking about um, were already uh, very ably introduced um, by, by Kim Clark, the first speaker. So um, I, I hope it, it's not too much repetition. I'm going to take a bit of a different approach um, to my presentation. I, I had it all set up with slides and then decided that um, uh, partly because of my discipline, partly because I do quite a bit of work in autoethnography, um, I, I was going to try and take a, a storytelling approach. And um, I do refer to two or three uh, theorists and writers and um, I'm hoping that uh, if, if people are interested in those references, um, you can either email me or we can maybe post them a bit later. So I just want to let you know that I'm sitting in my living room. Um, I'm I'm on Treaty Seven. Um, I'm on Treaty Seven lands here. I'm right beside the about a block away from the Bow River. For those of you who um, live in these territories in the city now called Calgary uh, in Blackfoot, it is Mukinsis. And the reason I keep looking up is I have a very high ceiling and in, right in front of me, uh, there are, there's a project that I did at the Banff Center in the mid 2000s that was just called Braids. And it was a, a bunch of braids really, um, but it was a public community project as well. And um, we, we now have in this house about 500 to 600 braids made by myself, students, and people in the uh, Banff Center community. And about half of them are up in the house. The reason that I mention this is that I, in the early 90s, just as I uh, finished my PhD and, and got a uh, position very briefly at UBC, um, I wrote a, a piece called Braids, and that was the beginning of my thinking about personal identity and activism in the context of, of myself um, as, a, as a South Asian mixed race activist, um, identifying also as Canadian. I was trying to, to figure out how to talk about racism and anti-racism uh, from the perspective of that hybrid position, if, if you like. And so many, many years later, I was sitting here um, thinking, how am I going to uh, talk about intersectionality when a lot of the ways that we talk about intersectionality and hybridity have certainly changed since the early 90s. We know that um, Kimberly, Crenshaw, and I'm just going to quote her because every, everyone does, partly, but because she, she really got us thinking about um, intersectionality in the context of race and gender, especially. Um, and that is how I came to the notion of intersectionality as well. Um, intersectionality, she says, is not about having multiple identities. You have three, I have six, and so on. It's about how structures make identi certain identities the vehicle for, for vulnerability. 
And it's the word vulnerability that I really like in this quotation. It is about context and therefore the term contextual intersectionality is useful. The analogy of a traffic intersection illustrates that racist oppression can hit in simultaneous multiple directions. So that's the end of that quote. I have to say for myself that it took me a while to realize that intersectionality is not an individual identity thing, a matter of conflicting identities and expressions. It's confusing though, as in its origins, the term doesn't always envision intersectionality as a web and a sticky one at that. And the, the, it's not even implicit, it's quite explicit in that quotation that there's a lot of violence in structural, um, structural or contextual intersectionality as some people call it to distinguish it from our own sense that we have intersecting identities. It's a structure like a grid where say, racism and sexism intersect. And those were the places where I first encountered the, the, the connections, uh, the intersectionalities and, the, and my sense that they were at odds with each other, the, my identities. Rather than colliding utterly, which is to driver and pedestrian, uh, which it is to a dri driver and pedestrian or to two cars, I've always envisioned that intersectional grid as a limiting structure and sometimes a violent structure, or, I as, or as I imagine it, riffing on the metaphor, is there enough signage for wayfinding through this traffic? Can we hear? Can we see properly? Do we find the whole scene frightening or perhaps invigorating? For a non-driver like myself, how often do I remember the near misses and the collisions and confusions, the structures of social and other identities created for me? If I'm in Aotearoa or if I'm in Scotland, have I turned in the right direction, walked or driven on the proper side of the road? Are we paying attention? Are there personal blind spots? Yes. Have we recognized them? Because the systems and structures some of us are taught better are more privileged than others to negotiate through, which is why many see intersection, intersectionality as more of a metaphor rather than often frightening and oppressive reality, one that can result in anger and despair and death. And if nothing else, COVID should have taught us that. Perhaps the hopelessness is for many, for many people, a kind of visitor, this hopelessness that inter, inter, intersectionality can visit, visit upon us. It depends, our hopelessness depends on those allies or supports or the sheer number of times and ways in which we are negotiating traffic or traffic is negotiating us. All of that was not how I planned to suppose, uh, planned or felt supposed to begin, but with a story of living oppression, an expression I rarely use from the perspective of relative privilege. I start with a story about a hospital and an ICU in November, this past November in Toronto, where my brother had ended up after traveling. He had meningitis and encephalitis and three strokes. Early November then on Coxwell Avenue, where COVID exhaustion had set into the hospital after many outbreaks. And the physical structure of the ICU was, and the whole hospital was a jumble of beds, literal red tape, trip hazards, and forbidding contradictory signage. How many visitors were allowed? Did we gown? Where did we get masks? Which elevator did we take to the same room each time? Were we allowed to eat in the cafeteria? This was in fact chaos. Most of the nurses, lab techs, et cetera, were women of color. The white nurses were supervisors. Doctors flew in and out. We were caught between reminding ourselves of what many of these people had gone through and still were, with COVID 
and fierce anger about my brother and the lack of information he had and the poor care he was getting. Families in that ICU had literally no space to meet. The chapel was closed. All of the waiting rooms had been converted into rooms for medical staff. They and we had to make life and death decisions hunkered down in hallways. There, I talked to my sister about intersectionality and alliance. How were we to protect my unconscious brother from what was horrific, with people in the ICU falling out of their beds ignored and families forced to make DNR decisions crowded near an elevator? Allyship in those cases narrowed to him, to insistence that we be heard, that all patient families have a space to sit, and that if we said hello to the medical staff in greeting, it would be civil to be greeted in return. It also meant recognizing levels of exhaustion, their levels of exhaustion, how racism and sexism were functioning there for the workers in ways that we had seen but very rarely experienced on the ground. We used that privilege of knowing systems and words and social media to complain. When he awoke from his coma, my brother also complained. I was astonished at his post-stroke clarity about the invasions of bodily autonomy, his and others. And I thought what it must be like to be a man. I myself go silent in similar medical contexts. But even he was unable to persuade them to move him out to a different hospital for rehab. We discuss systemic punishment and indeed hopelessness in the realm of pain and another COVID outbreak at the hospital. For many there, that hospital was a place of hopelessness and death. For us also, indignation and anger. In the classroom, I consider myself first and foremost to be an anti-racist and social justice educator. For many of us, the complexities of how intersectionality functions, our personal stories of coming to recognition may feel oddly linear, at least when I teach it does. My teaching has echoed how I learned about oppression and about a privilege and how they operate hand in hand in personal and community contexts. I do talk about myself a lot in the classroom. Through feminism first and then less comfortably through racism and anti-racism, a lonelier and lonely still series of recognitions and alliances. We used to call it coalition. That's the, that's, those are the decades that I come from. But community work in arts organizations was in both, was in my 20s and 40s and 60s, how I came to understand both solidarity and alliance, as well as the deep ways in which we are marked by and mark others through privilege. I have not yet in this backwards and forwards tale determined how to become a good or strong ally, except to learn how it felt to have them and be recognized them, excuse me, I'm getting a bit, a bit emotional, um, to, and to be recognized by them. In academia, it came late, but it did. As I wove my way through the intersections of other unrecognized processes, always there of invisibility, in chronic illness, that I now name as semi-visible disability, also being a source of privacy and shame, especially in academia entrenched since adolescence. I have not until recently allied with others who experience illness through its structures and intersections, except in the classroom. For me, quite early, it was important for my safety, but also to engage with students in the classroom as a political act to disclose my illnesses, to inform that I had both epilepsy and diabetes, two illnesses that intersect with each other in the most frightening and unexpected ways. They, they have brought me and others into collision with the medical system I was talking about a bit earlier, 
that I witnessed at its worst in the last few months. And then as I age, I attempt to engage with the meanings of how a familial congenital illness intertwines with stories of teaching. Of my immigrant family of seven, there are three of us left, and we, th we thought we had lost another. What spaces have I yet to discover in opening, in opening the spaces of disclosure and discussion about disability and illness in a recent graduate seminar on chronic illness? That space was one of mutual solidarity and pretty rare in my teaching experience. Or as I work my way through the difficulties of imagining intentional intersectionality, intentional anti-racism, intentional anti-ableism in new ways, I'm newly and differently aware, but always aware of how instructional spaces are inherently inequitable, but that nothing about us without us is beginning to resonate, resonate for some of us and our allies. A brief story, but one that will resonate in the context of being a good ally or what that might mean in context of specific privilege, instructor and student, and the systems that intersect to provide us both the power and the privilege to dominate. How do we do that and mentor, coach, sponsor, advocate, or ally ourselves? In working with others on Itapetope, the university's Indigenous strategy, and after several years teaching Indigenous studies courses, I, I found that struggles with what Dwayne Donald calls colonial frontier logics and Willie Ermine's teachings about ethical space, spaces of engagement, transformative. Familiar to many, Ermine's work made me rethink how to teach. Particularly, the concert, particularly against or with, alongside the conservative contrarian or the denialist student while recalling and attempting to recognize that the cultural safety of indigenous students and other racialized and equity deserving students is critical. These are conflicting and intersecting spaces and my job is to work with the engaging, the engagement part of, of ethical space, processes that have been rigorously excised from most teaching practices and ways of approaching social justice and anti-oppression work. Rethinking how I did this work in community, exploring difficulty and argument rather than ruling it out, transformed some of those spaces for me. However, in the classroom, I'm still working out the proprieties of safety. I go back to bell hooks often and my own power in the classroom relative to other intersecting and sometimes provisional privileges. I've done two guest lectures in the last short while. And in one of them, there's, I've been dealing with residential school denialism and trying to do it through ethical relationality. I haven't even talked about COVID racism, COVID racism and long COVID as of yet. Um, another illness that I am uh, working through or when intersections intertwine badly or engaging in this work on a bad epilepsy day as I am today or a low blood sugar day or a diabetes on a day when I'm not able to see because I have diabetes. The utterances and the contestations are enough. So I'm going to return now to the image of the braids because it takes me back to my youth for one thing. It takes me back to my early days as an academic when a lot seemed possible, but it was also a frightening place to be. And remind myself that in my art, work, I did have a way of imaging and thinking through intersectionality. And, but it was, a, it was a little deficient because it, in the image of the braids, which the braids are very messy, 
um, there isn't that tension or what I earlier called violence. And that as, as life goes on and as we pursue this inside or outside of academia and community, um, the, the, the violence that intersection, intersectionalities um, produces in people, those who have privilege, as well as on people's bodies, I think is really something that we as academics and students need to address. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Runa Srivastava. I really um, enjoyed this presentation and uh, and builds really well with um, Dr. Kim Clark's presentation and brought, brings to light some of the experiences we have. I really appreciated your discussion on intersectionality because this is the theme of, of this week as well around solidarity and how we how we experience the world as individuals and how Kimberly Crenshaw's definition really highlights where we need to come back because I think we tend to lose the definition a little bit around that multiple identities and we are reminded of the structural uh, component, the way that oppression functions in our experiences and the way we relate with systems and peoples around us. So I, I really appreciated that and I think we'll come back to it. So next um, presenter without further ado and our final presenter for the keynote panel is Dr. Sonia Aujla Boulard. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, uh, Dr. Aujla Boulard identifies as a Canadian woman scholar, researcher, educator residing in uh, Calgary. Um, her present uh, work focuses on anti-racism as an institutional practice and applications of diversity, inclusion, and equity between schools and racialized communities. Uh, you know, I think uh, many of you might know uh, uh, that uh, Dr. Sanya Aujla-Bolar is an alumna of the University of Calgary and has the Women's Resource Center Distinguished Alumna Award uh, in 2013. Her present roles include community advocacy with the World Sikh Organization of Canada, Calgary Anti-Racism Action Committee. Um, Dr. Aujla Bular has also uh, uh, been uh, involved in the South Asian Police Advisory Community for the Calgary Police Service, the Government of Alberta Anti-Racism Advisory Council, and the Alberta Association for the Multicultural Education. So many really informative uh, uh, spaces that will uh, inform, I'm sure, the talk and the, the ways of presenting the, the, the theme today. So without further ado, please, uh, uh, Sonia, go ahead. Thank you so much, Savan, for that introduction. And I am very much humbled and honored to be a um, part of this panel here today. I'll just wait for my um, slides to come up. My apologies, I'm having technical difficulties on my side. So that will have to be held for me. And I'll have to say next slide as we go through. Um, but before I begin, even I, what really spoke to me with our um, Dr. Kim Clark and Dr. Aruna Srivasya is the idea of human dignity. And when we're talking about solidarity, um, intersectionality and equity, it really comes down to how our human dignity is seen, heard and felt by all of us here within this presentation or this um, webinar today. But um, where I'm going to be speaking from today is the aspect of community and community advocacy and the role of volunteerism. So I'll go to the next slide, please. Oh, one more. Sorry. Thank you. So that intersectional lens, this was already spoken to so eloquently um, with the other two panelists, and that is really starting with myself. And I go by my pronouns are she, her. I have personally, as a Sikh Punjabi woman, I will be speaking to you today. As you've seen in the introduction, I have positioned on many different boards as an active volunteer community advocate within the local, provincial, and federal jurisdictions of where I reside currently on McKintis territory or Blackfoot territory. Um, but I also have the experience as a public school teacher, which I've been humbled to be part of for the past 16 years of my career. And with that, I speak today in solidarity with those groups, marginalized, racialized, um, Black, Indigenous, racialized communities again, in the context that the social hierarchies that which we are part of, our intersections and are part of, are also in support of the very structures that we are seeking to eliminate, if not at the very least address 
um, in our day-to-day -day work. And so all of these parts, intersections of my identity, being a racialized woman, a second generation immigrant, a mother, daughter, a partner in a heteronormative relationship, teacher, scholar, researcher, really fall to the idea of of um, within my own faith, the Sikh concept of seva, which is selfless service. And I can't get into that as much today as I would like, but I bring this up in a key point to frame the idea of volunteerism with a key example, and that is of Bill 21. So for anyone who does not know of Bill 21, it is a legislation that has been passed in the province of Quebec that is basically in its entirety is not allowing for persons who wear articles of faith um, that includes in my faith with the Sikh religion of anyone who wears a dastar or a turban to practice in public service. So that impacts teachers, lawyers, judges, anyone in the public service and who is residing in the province of Quebec is unable to work in those professions if they have their articles of faith. And that legislation was passed in 2018, Bill 21. It is being actively fought against um, within the World Sick Organization, which I am a board member of. But I bring that today because at the city of Calgary and my role with the Anti-Racism Action Committee, we began this conversation last year when municipalities across this country decided to support organizations, grassroots organizations, such as the World Sick Organization, the National Council for Muslims, and many others, in the fight that's going up to Supreme Court right now because it is an infringement of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Um, but of course, the legislation was passed under a non-withstanding clause. And I was asked the question when I posed um, I, asked, I was asked the question of when I advocate for Bill 21, in what role am I speaking of? Am I speaking as a community member? Am I speaking in my role as the chair for the Anti-Racism Action Committee? Or am I speaking as a board member to the World Sick Organization? And that really struck me for a variety of reasons. But the main thing being, our intersections are our lived experiences. It is from where we are, our whole being. So and all the intersections that come across to others in the way that they perceive us to be really becomes what we have embodied by virtue of standing within a room or being part of a conversation. For Bill 21, I answered that question with very much with I'm all of these and possibly more and then nothing at all. Because as a community member, Ideologies do not stop at any borders. When we have a racist legislation that's put in place to actively remove and not allow people who have their articles of faith as part of their identity, as part of their being, practicing the profession of teaching, for example, that in itself is something that I cannot separate. I cannot separate them from where I speak, for whom I'm speaking to, because it is impacting every part of my life. And that goes for so many of persons without throughout this um, land in Canada that are feeling and feeling that impact significantly in their everyday lives. Um, next slide, please. So advocacy and reciprocity are the main ideas that I would like to really bring forth today in my presentation to you talking from the the perspective of being a, a community advocate, but also volunteerism as a whole. So advocacy in itself can be defined as to promote and actively engage with the cause in a public forum. I think all of us can think of a time that we have engaged in that in some way or form. And volunteering in, for anyone is a form of public, often public service that is unpaid. That is critical, and I'll explain more of that as we move forward. But in the work of anti-racism, diversity, equity, inclusion, all of those initiatives, there is a consistent undervaluing of lived experiences, of the intersections of which we bring, which we embody in our day-to-day -day work. The reciprocity for persons who engage with DEI, DEI or anti-racism consultations or any of those pieces are providing their time and energy over and over and over again oftentimes without even being asked if this is an okay or a place to have those experiences shared or to take that. Um, what results is an extraction. The ideas, the knowledge based on lived experiences of racialized community members is something that is ongoing. And yet the reciprocity from that and how that knowledge, how those ideas are being taken into play to enact a meaningful change is unseen, undervalued, or unheard of. 
So those intersections with our lived experiences and advocacy efforts are ongoing. And it's also really important to understand that when I speak to volunteerism, that is also coming from a point of privilege. That is coming from the idea that volunteerism in its entirety is an abil something that you have the ability to do because you are at a means of being financially stable, for example. Um, I was part of a discussion last year with the city of Calgary and how volunteerism is unable to recruit as, as a general, like the, the stats and the analysis that was taking place um, of racialized community members, period. Um, but I beg to differ on that because if there's no formal recording of volunteers being racialized or with their different identity markers that they suit, we choose to disclose, there is still an aspect of volunteerism within our day-to-day -day lives. Because by virtue of being who we are and how we are seen in that racial constructs, we are speaking to these issues by virtue of what work we do and what we agree with and what we do not. And I'm speaking from my own personal experience, but also with that greater understanding that the pattern that we often see in talking to DEI initiatives is held or the weight of is held onto one person who is racialized or the minority person within the room. There is again, the right to hope to belong and to thrive within all of the means that we take play when we go for advocating for the various causes that we believe in. Um, but there's also that aspect of reciprocity that is still not being addressed in its entirety. Next slide, please. So community advocacy, let's think and talk about how this, we have gotten even where we are today. And we know we don't have to look very far, but we can just look back to 2020. Um, with the murder of George Floyd, we saw a huge amplification of what anti-racism actually meant and how that could differ, but also support the initiatives of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Within the city of Calgary and across Canada, we definitely understand understood community activism in its entirety because it was visibly made, we were visibly aware of it um, through media, through social media channels. And for many groups who have continued to work on these advocacy efforts of anti-racism, prior to 20, 2020 speak to that amplification, speak to how much power and how much there was request, there were requests coming out, there was all this need to address these things. The City of Calgary Anti-Racism Action Committee was in result of the public hearings that were that took place here at the at, um, City Hall during that time. So DEI comes from a grassroots advocacy. That's where it has begun. We can go decades back. We can go back to even, you know, civil rights movement coming from out of America and Black feminism around that. It's anti-racism 101. So the historical roots are important. But again, when we go into thinking about that reciprocity from that advocacy, the weight that to enact transform transformational change resides with those who hold institutional power. And I have, a, I have a joke here that I often say, try to say it lightly, but uh, all jokes aside, I'll tell you the joke first. It's really, in all of my work, what I'm able to say and what I'm able to speak to, in my mind, I'm always saying, and I've said it out loud a couple of times, I've said, you know, it's fine, I can say this because you can't fire a volunteer. And, you know, I get some chuckles and even myself, I'm like, yeah, I, I'm, you know, there's a, there's an element of agency that I'm able to speak to these things critically and with awareness and with the community voice behind me. But the actual fact is you can't fire the volunteer because there's no need to. If you're in a position of volunteer or an advocate at the grassroots level, you're not actually in a position to make transformational change. You don't have that power to enact that. That is within the institutions by which we are advocating for and against. So the accountability, moving into that, it's missing. If we are working on DEI initiatives and the community voice is there and there is advocacy occurring, where is the reciprocity in going back to community and going back to understanding how has this impacted your day-to-day -day life individually, within your group, within your circle? Where is that accountability and how is that heard and seen? What advocacy are we enabling for people to actually feel like they, the DEI initiatives or the things that have been taking place, especially with the amplification in the past few years, is really making an impact directly on them or community. Solidarity, of course, exists in the collaboration and the unwavering commitment to having this realized. And so with that, I think it's really important to understand that 
advocacy in itself is a day-to-day -day experience. It's on, It's going to be part of anyone that's in your classroom. For those of you here who are you know, in the position of professors, it's those of, for students, it's there in the community circles that you're with. But even if it's not directly in front of you, we all exist within a community. We all are coming from those different intersections. And so solidarity to exist within that also needs to recognize the communities by which we come from. Next slide, please. So what has this been impeded by in terms of an advocacy standpoint and for community? I have been myself at the forefront of experiencing this, but also in the years that I have been um, within this advocacy role, it is these three things that have continuously impeded a stronger movement for change. Number one, the day-to-day -day circumstances, whether it's in the news, political upheaval, or just the form of survival. It is ongoing and it's very, very difficult for community members to think and act for this movement to change while dealing with the everyday of being a racialized person in these circles. Of course, systemic racism and institutional structures, the shift in or the dynamics of power are always at play. Again, we are all part of these social hierarchies that are supported by these very structures. In the institution of education, um, at a higher education or within even the public system or a K-12 education, there are structures in place that continuously downplay, if not outrightly oppress, the lived experiences and the different perspectives that are there for change. Example, key example of this is the curriculum development that we have underway and has been ongoing for the past two years through provincial legislation, where that curriculum speaks to a larger and more sustainable process of how we are educating our youth to speak to these issues is non-existent. And if it does come up, it's often within the structures that uphold social hierarchies and uphold the, the oppression of lived experiences. Last but not least, what else is the what else is impeding a movement for change is a focus on individual or independent sources of change versus a system change around the power dynamics that uphold this exclusion. The example that I can give you for here, again, even going back to Bill 21, is we cannot enact change as an individual person. We do need that advocacy. And with the World Sick Organization and the group that's together at the City of Calgary Anti-Racism Action Committee, there is a collective voice coming together with lived experiences, expertise, and a commitment to advocating for human rights together that share, that hold a larger platform to go forward. However, when we are seeing institutional changes happening, this is from the community perspective, we're often seeing that those ideas and those asks for a policy change are often being handed over to one, two, or maybe three individuals on the side of a department that are leading EDI. And that is very problematic because the weight and burden that it goes on to some in, to individuals is, of course, exhausting in itself, but also we can see that that won't be accountable or sustainable over time. And I know that um, there are many probably on this webinar and for myself, my own mentors who have been working on the, the work of anti-racism for decades. And it is something that needs to be embedded and centered rather than as a sign. Next slide, please. So equity in action or inequity enacted. I like to have a play on words because I am a teacher. Um, again, I'm going into that idea of DEI initiatives when we're centering systems of oppression such as white supremacy. This is a term, a concept that we're not even ready to speak to in the larger circles as we are very much aware that it is part of our day-to-day -day reality within institutions. With this, our dynamics remain intact in narratives of learning and growth. And so with this, we often hear, and I, this is something that I'm coming across day in, day out, and with community members as well, is that we're still talking about learning and growing and understanding anti-racism. We're still wanting to talk about what that means and how that impacts people and how they feel about it. The reality being is white supremacy in itself has enacted harm. It is impacting and continues to impact 
groups and persons across this land. So representation of racialized persons is key to having within organizations. It provides accountability. It is something that is seen as embedded, but also can be sustained over time when it is held by those who have the lived experiences and the consultation of of an expertise and a commitment, an unwavering a commitment to not only learn and grow, but to actively resist and deconstruct those systems that are upholding social hierarchies. And volunteerism, again, is the accepted safe form of advocating for um, equity and human rights. However, the impact of this is there is racial exhaustion. When advocacy continues to fall to an explanation of why something is important, why something needs to continue to happen. That is in itself a, a result of white supremacy or dominant ways of thinking. Because the every time when we go into a space where we're advocating for a certain thing, for example, Bill 21, it is starting from the get-go of explaining why it is important, why the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in impact a group in a certain way, why it isn't something that should be ignored by Alberta or by Calgary in itself, because it is impacting communities across this world. That marginalization is ongoing and constant. And fine, last but not least, what remains the dominant and self-sustaining narrative? So the social implications that continue to marginalize advocacy efforts, it really comes down to, down to that access to knowledge and agency. So those who are able to take and what, me, in lack of better words, when we extract information or we're taking lived experiences and we're having all that, what we do with that information, how we care for it, what we are accountable to is back to community voices. Community needs to have a say in how this is being felt, seen and heard by themselves. And my second last slide, please. So recognizing racism as an action. Dr. Sarah Ahmed talks about doing diversity um, in institutions such as education or within governance structures as well, is also a need to understand the institutional realities that have become a given. So growth and learning are signs of a strong commitment to learning when we're talking about racism, when we're acknowledging white supremacy as a system of oppression. However, where that is coming from and who and how it is centered is also very easily sliding into a dominant mainstream narratives, where when we speak to a system of oppression, we often see that it turns into how this is being received rather than the impact that the communities are actually feeling in this day to day in their day to day lives. So approaching change, holding or deconstructing dynamics of power are absolutely essential to all of this. The intention for all of us here today gathered, and as you've heard from the other panelists and EDI Week in general, is to work towards an equitable and inclusive society. The impact is to understand that when you're asking for and receiving knowledge, it is an extraction, and that is undervalued. The extraction itself is a point of being undervaluing, undervaluing community perspectives. However, to be reciprocal, we need to appreciate this through actual policy and structural change and that can be seen, heard, and felt by the very communities that we're advocating for in the first place. And last slide, please. So I'd like to end with just saying that for me, I really like alliterations, again, being a teacher. Um, all of what I hope to have brought to you today in terms of volunteering, advocacy, and all of those roles in community voice is in order to action solidarity, we have to amplify intersectionality in terms of who we are bringing into our spaces of work in our organizations, institu institutions, who is able to speak freely, openly with the support of policy change coming down the pipe. And that in effect will achieve equity because until we understand the intersectionality of our identities and decenter white supremacy as being a focal factor in that, we cannot achieve equity going forward for community advocacy efforts that have been part of our history and will continue to be so for the generations to come. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sonia Ajlabura, for the wonderful presentation and a lot of things. The wordplay was really 
uh, I, I spent a few minutes reading them and rereading them to kind of understand the play. So I, I appreciate that. Um, there's a lot you mentioned, you know, whether it's around community and volunteerism and the aspects of volunteerism and how that's perceived solidarity and intersectionality and how that builds also with the presentations by Kim and Aruna. And so all of those weaving together um, creates a really important ground of thinking. And of course, you know, there's there's each each presentation has, uh, uh, you know, we can we can talk for 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 a long time about each presentation and the depth and the time and the effort spent to reflect on them. Maybe I'll pick up on the last um, thing to begin, and I'm sure uh, more and more questions are coming in, so we'll keep monitoring. But to begin on that last uh, a slide that you had on actioning solidarity, amplifying intersectionality, achieving equity, um, I really like that because that was actually something I was jotting down as you were all talking around intersectionality, given it's one of the themes like solidarity through intersectional lenses um, and a reminder of what it actually means and where we need to turn back to those definitions to ground ourselves and move away sometimes from, you know, um, watering down of terms or uh, losing their, their intended value in many ways and the work that we do in EDI space. So coming back to intersectionality, maybe uh, kind of, you know, you can, three of you can comment. Uh, and if you don't want to comment or speak to each other, we can move to the next question as well. But as an opening kind of reflection, how does intersectionality help us become more consciously intentional uh, in thinking about solidarity uh, with the various yet, you know, again, intersection and linked causes that we associate, associate ourselves with? How, how do we think about intersectionality in the way that we initiate solidarity or we think about solidarity, I guess, to put it in simple terms, but um, please feel free to, to engage and, and uh, in the way that you see is, is best based on the research and the work that you do. Um, do you want to, uh, be, do you want, can we begin with the first presenter, Kim, are you ready to kind of go back and, and talk or we can also begin with Runa, however it works out for you. Um, I'm actually going to come and come at it from an angle. Um, one of the things that uh, COVID really um, caused for me was to sort of rethink how I was approaching the classroom. Um, and the extent to which I was assuming that the students in my classroom were like me when I was a student um, and, you know, had all of the same uh, motivation and skills and advantages that helped me to get a PhD. Um, and, and, uh, and, and so to kind of broaden my sense of what are the different things happening in students' lives, um, this is, yeah, this is, I guess, more about solidarity than intersectionality, but to sort of be aware of the sort of the full, the full person um, in our classroom uh, who, you know, who's, who was affected by, by illness, by, by family obligations, by, you know, so many different things, children, elder care, um, all of those things that, that made me rethink uh, do I assume that all students have complete control over their schedules and their lives and their circumstances? Um, and you know, what about you know, what about the uh, people with young children in my classroom? What about um, the people who who have health vulnerabilities? What about all of these things that come together and all of the people whose paths come together um, in in that classroom? And how can everyone be seen? you know, as, as the full person, right? And, and to offer everyone, including the instructor, <laughs> a bit of grace, you know? Um, so I went, actually, I was starting to think about the sort of COVID reset in my own mind about thinking, but I kind of didn't ever get to intersectionality. Um, but I think that, you know, the solidarity that comes from just um, shifting our focus enough to recognize who, you know, who are we, who are we with in the classroom? Um, and to teach the students we have and not the students we were um, or, or think we, you know, would like to have. Um, actually, we have amazing students <laughs> who bring very different kinds of, of experiences to the classroom that enrich the whole discussion. Um, and when I, you know, started to do this work and, and learn more from students with disabilities, who, as I say, could be any of us at any moment, um, you know, I was thinking about how 
in the context of COVID, how much we learned uh, from people with disabilities about how to adapt to these new circumstances we were facing. Um, so this is, this is, I blame you, Savan, for starting with me <laughs> with thinking more about <laughs> inter intersectionality. So I'll let the other uh, panelists uh, as, uh, answer your question maybe more directly. <laughs> That, that was great, actually, and a reminder also of, of the role of faculty as, as teachers, as educators and knowledge holders, we're also learners constantly, and I think it, it puts into perspective the learner and educator um, kind of dynamic and, and makes us, you know, reevaluate of our role in general and how that translates into community as well, because I think that's, that's also a major part of the conversation. But I'll move to Aruna, please go ahead. Um. Okay, I've got a big black Zoom screen in front of me, so I, so I hope I can get rid of it. Um, yeah, there we go. Um, so, I, 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 in terms of in intersection intersectionality, I think what I didn't do in 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 my talk was was make the connections between intersectionality the intersectionalities and um, how, uh, how, again, it's sort of pedagogical, like how we experience, how we experience it as a concept. And, and also then what does that have to do with, um, with solidarity, which I think is not a, a not, not a, a, a word that I use as often as some of the other ones that that are connected to it, like like alliance or um, the very old fashioned coalition. Um, but and I just lost my train of thought. Um, in what well, that's what I was going to say. In the classroom, I I find that um, teaching, even uh, doing theoretical reading on intersectionality, is very very difficult for. Um, students in the classroom who've never encountered it before. So, so they, um, there is that tendency to individualize it. I have, I have these identities. And that's partly my fault as an instructor because we do do a lot of work around uh, you know, reflection and critique on um, what makes us who we are as individuals. And so I think that that, that is, um, it's just a natural kind of tendency. Um, but but for for me, particularly working on disability and chronic illness and the relationships between them in disability studies and in the work we we'd, we've been doing on dimensions and so forth, I find it that's the hard hardest of the intersection intersectionalities that I experience to to be to intellectualize. Uh, whereas, um, and race, I, I can't intellectualize often either, but all of the others, you know, my um, lack of, of attachment to religion or um, even gender, I don't, I don't find that hard to, um, to see as, as a systemic issue. Um, or what, what Sonia was, was talking about in the context of, um, of the, the sort of ongoing debates in in Canada about re religious um, r religious or faith um, uh, clothing or or symbols, it, it's a uh, something that we have returned to over and over again in Alberta with a a long debate. Um, so I, I, for me, the both the way the way that these connect is around how we, how we, I was going to say push how how we engage people who who, who either are very attached to an, an identity and feel it to be threatening to talk about intersectionality, and the the ways that I do that, which I didn't used to do successfully, is to is to do it through disclosure. This is, this is, these are my privileges and these are the ways that certain time, certain times in my life, um, these particular st structured identities come into play 
and these are times that they don't, or I may not be aware of them. That's more accurate. Thanks, uh, Aruna. So Sonia, I'll leave it to you for, for the last response. Thank you. So for intersectionality, I think it's really key and important. And this goes back to the, the founder of intersectionality is the theoretical framework or concept, and that's Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, how you had mentioned. And that's the silences, the silent voices within those intersections, the ones that we don't know of or hear of or understand. And that goes back to the structures that are in place that actively silence those voices. I'm an elder at the city of Calgary when um, Councillor McLean had made those atrocious comments just a little while ago about Indigenous people, spoke to the, the need for nothing about us without us. And that's key because that is a very important frame to understand how intersections work within what, how we speak and our experiences or how they are taken up in various institutions. So whose voices are being silenced actively? Whose stories are we not hearing? And when lived experiences are shared to hope and enact for change, how is though how is that being taken or given back to the very communities whose voices were taken up in the first place? And I think that's key with intersectionality. Um, the, the, Communities who are really good at speaking to inter intersectionality without ever having to name that are the students that I work with in middle school. They can very easily tell us all of the pieces that they are proud of and being part of, but they also are very, very, very much aware of parts of their identity that they feel are constantly belittled or seen as troublemaking. And that does not change in adulthood. We're just very good at not speaking to our privileges and the biases and the places where we are marginalized within our identities. And that has to be named. We as adults really need to do that well. And I think community voices are very much actively involved in that and trying to say that, but it's not supported by the structures in place. So for, for the institutional side, I think that's where intersectionality needs to come is whose, vo by, whose voices are being actively suppressed and not engaged with. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Actually, uh, it, it, it makes a lot of sense, especially because we're thinking around community, right? And I think the three of you touched in community in different ways. So, you know, Kim, in your presentation, you talked about the research you did with the student body, the students' voices were center, and that's the community you were engaging with and, and trying to understand their experiences in policy change, or even in, in small changes you can do in the classroom to make uh, in these individuals' lives better and, and you know, make their learning facilitate facilitated. Um, and I think, you know, Aruna, you, you talked about community in, in different ways, also by centering yourself around that community engagement and the ways in which you engage with, with others around change. Um, and I thought, you know, Sonia, you, you talked about it also in the context of of course, volunteerism and how we're engaged. I always say, you know, as a, as a racialized person, when I, as a racialized woman, when I came to Canada, people talked about volunteerism and I thought, wow, it's a term that's around like, you know, you, you add it on your CV, yet I've always volunteered my whole life in my community. So now I have to list it on my CV as an experience. And, but anyway, we can talk about that, I guess, long enough. But um, one of the things that I really appreciated is the extraction uh, that you talked about, right? So we, we don't want knowledge to be extracted from communities in a way that doesn't create some form of benefit, some form of engagement, some form of authentic change. So, you know, we have different ways of thinking of community, but maybe to bring it back to the, to, to again, the theme of the conference or the, the, the keynote today is around, you know, um, why, why is it that we need to rely on community for those changes that we're doing? And how do we do it in a way that's not extractive, or at least doesn't feel extractive to communities around the ways in that we envision change? So um, a kind of a more concrete uh, examples or, or more theoretical, however you approach it around principles or, or actions. But um, I can, you know, I'll leave it open to whoever wants to start, uh, not to bring back, you know, Kim at the first here, but um, any anyone who wants to jump in, we don't have a lot of time left, but I think it's been so interesting that our participants can maybe give us a few more minutes. Do you feel like you can start, Kim? Sorry to put you on the spot again on the first one. <laughs> That's okay. Um, it's an interesting question, and there's a question in, in the Q&A as well about extraction. Um, and I... Um, I have to say, I did not expect this little side project 
um, which I engaged in partly because I was worried about all this rush back to normal. And I thought, okay, we actually implemented some accessibility. What has been the ex experience of students with disability? Um, so I started, I thought, okay, if, maybe we need to, to pause and gather some information um, about their experiences. Um, and as a minimum, I thought maybe this was an opportunity to give the three students on my team an opportunity to, to learn some, get some research experience. And, and uh, so that was kind of my minimal expectation of what, um, and they were paid for their summer work. So um, that was my first goal, right? Students who might not otherwise have had an opportunity. Um, so I was very surprised to actually get such full, rich responses um, from students to our survey. And, and since then I've been, because clearly they were motivated by wanting to um, have their voices heard and, 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 and see if any change could be affected. So I've been accepting any invitations, in fact, to, to speak from this research. Um, yeah, so I, um, there was a question about, about uh, financial compensation um, in, in, in the, in the Q&A. Um, yeah, it's, I think it's a really important point, um, but, but I will say at least in my case, this is not my, this is not really my area. Um, so I, so for one thing, we don't know who answered our survey, um, but, but, but I am responding to their call to share, to share their experiences. Um, so I, yeah, this is why I'm here instead of um, doing my research in, in the archive, just over there. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think it's a very important point about, you know, are we extracting information and, and you know, building our careers from it or, you know, where's that line uh, with, with uh, sharing an experience that maybe people are not aware of? Yeah. And in a way that's authentic, in a way that's ethical, in a way that respects the voices, but still centers them and um, and, so, and giving back can be in different ways, it doesn't have to be financial contribution or payment, but that obviously is part of the consideration. So I appreciate that point, uh, Kim, as a reminder of how you can share. And I just hope that everyone takes away at least one, one insight <laughs> that that's easy for them um, and to implement. That would be, that would be, I think, great from the perspective of the students who participated in my research. Yeah. Um, we can go next to uh, Aruna or Sonia. It's okay, Sonia, you're ready. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I don't want to lose my train of thought because it's, it's such a great conversation and I'm looking at the Q&A as well. So I'm going to first speak about the financial compensation. That's an excellent question. That is something that the Anti-Racism Action Committee at the City of Calgary has advocated for, not for our committee, but for across the boards and commissions as something that needs to be honored and valued because extraction is very easily taken when you have persons having to relive their lived experiences, especially around racial trauma and intergenerational trauma, to enact blank change. We all often hear the change will come, the learning and growth. We know that already, but it is painful then beyond a doubt for those who are continuing to live that day in, day out. Not that financial compensation can necessarily um, mediate that, but the reality historically is that within DEI anti-racism, those are terms that we have not amplified as much as we've seen in the past few years. And that conversation, that knowledge has always been seen as something that, well, we can just understand that by asking that problematic question of where are you from? Tell me a little bit more about your experiences. Tell me how I can be a better person in this place of work to make it feel that you are, that constant extraction has always been part and parcel of this conversation. So financial compensation is absolutely one thing that needs to be done when people are offering their lived experiences. One of the boards and commissions at City of Calgary is around accessibility and disability. That needs to be addressed. It needs to be seen as valued. And we do live in a capitalist society that puts value in an economic form. It's one of many. And up until this point, it's not occurring at all. So speaking to community, again, um, just my last point, and then I'll turn it over to Aruna. But when there is reciprocity, it needs to be defined and then evaluated by the community itself that provided their information to begin with. It cannot be with those who hold an institutional power 
at all. That is where we lose the grassroots advocacy and why we continue to see exhaustion at the front lines of persons trying to relive and explain why X, Y, Z, again, is important for human dignity. Thank you for that, Sonia. Aruna, please go ahead. Um, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I, would, uh, I would want to add to particularly what um, Kim has been saying about, um, hmm, I'm gonna sound judgmental, um, the, just trying the, the things that are uh, both in the classroom and I, I, I'm doing a lot of work on accessibility and disability in quotation marks um, around staff and faculty because the a, a lot of the resistance around that, particularly around uh, COVID provisions, has been it's just really hard to do, you know, and, and and we're used to saying that. So in the context of even using words like accommodation, at any context with any you know with with illness, disability, um, neurodiversity, those kinds of things, um, we we are so used to to the language, the like the the legalistic language, that um, it it's only looking at, at a couple other institutions. I don't can't think of any Canadian ones where where people are actually spending some time refiguring the language of accommodation, disability, and the process. Do you have to go to your doctor and get a medical certificate? Do you? Um, because we've done this at UC, uh, we've done it before, you know, with the, with um, when there've been critical events, including COVID, but before that, where we've just said, oh no, let's just take the student at their word, you know? Uh, so we have a lot of things now that didn't exist five, six years ago, where a student just swore an oath to say, uh, I, I couldn't be in class or, yes, I, I lost my homework or, you know, whatever it was that they were saying. Um, and I, I, th I thought that was a huge step forward for equity, but it actually has slid back since the supposed end of COVID. We're now getting back into these punitive ways of dealing with students and instructors where we're not being, I, I've taught online since the late nineties. And because I don't have a visible disability, um, I, I am now getting pushback about just doing what I used to do, which was called blended learning. Um, and, and, and I think those are the kinds of things that we really do have ourselves to push back on and say, um, the, there is that access friction. We're going to create more. Um, if we don't, in, if the institution doesn't realize that it's, it's pulling people back from um, arrangements they made with their, you know, with their unit or um, pre-COVID or during COVID or whatever. Um, and and this, this is getting worse and worse, you know, um, even discussions about hybrid work don't talk that talk about people like me who actually can't see the camera. Like it, you know, if, if I'm visually impaired, I can't see the screen on the camera on a what do they call it? Owl camera. And those are the kinds of things that we we have to be able to have those pushback conversations about in a in a way that um, um, we've started to talk about but we don't have any strategies for yet. How do we, how do we just say no? Um, that, you know, I, I can't see. So if I can't see, then what is the university going to do to enable my work? Thank you so much, uh, uh, Aruna, for, for that last response. And, uh, you know, I, I really appreciated this conversation, all the presentations. They were 
focusing on different ways of thinking about, you know, intersectionality, solidarity, and also, uh, you know, thinking of, of how we bring forward change, what are the things that we can do to bring forward change, and that really is the theme of, of EDI Week uh, 2023 at U Calgary for this year, um, and I, I think there's so many things that stood out to me, so many words, you know, from the braids to the sticky webs, uh, and as a way of thinking around how things work together, um, to the way in which we need to continuously send on the voices of the peoples uh, uh, that are impacted, you know, by the changes that we are being, bringing forward, by the ways that we are planning our strategies and policies around. So I really have, uh, you know, uh, th there's a lot of questions, I'm sure. Uh, there's a lot of conversations that we can pull from here, and I hope that we will continue these in various formats, but I'm so appreciative of the additional time you gave us, and thank you so much for, for, for being here um, at uh, and for the audience as well. So there are so many more panels, workshops, presentations taking place throughout this week on our website, uh, hosted by the EDI office, but also, you know, across the university. So for more uh, information on Equity, Diversity, Inclusion Week, please visit ucalgary.ca for forward slash equity dash diversity dash inclusion the yen you will find a schedule of events until the end of the week um once again thank you so much for celebrating this week with us and we really uh, wish you all a, a pleasant uh, rest of your week and i just want to also thank uh, the um, community on campus that has been so supportive so collaborative to organize all these events i I really appreciate that as a, as a new member of the U Calgary community. Um, and I want to thank the EDI Week Planning Committee members as well, with, with whom we have been meeting for many weeks to really bring forward a lot of the events. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.